The ontological argument is a purely a priori logical argument that operates like a mathematical proof. It derives the existence of a perfect being from the laws of modal logic themselves. It's a technical argument for the existence and properties of God. That's why this is my favorite argument for the existence of God, because it goes beyond fallible evidence and, when understood correctly, is virtually impossible to argue against. In the field of philosophical theology, there are two competing definitions of God. In creator theology, God is defined as the creator of all that is not God. In perfect being theology, God is defined as a maximally great being, which means that God possesses all great-making properties such as love, knowledge, and power and possesses each in a maximal way. He also possesses no flaws, such as immorality. He would be all-powerful, all-loving, and all-knowing. I intend to show you these three things about this maximally great being. One, a maximally great being exists, hence perfect being theology is the correct one. Two, only one maximally great being can possibly exist, and hence only monotheism can be true. And three, a maximally great being must be multipersonal, in other words, the Unitarian or one person idea of God found in Rabbinic Judaism and Islam is false, and therefore the being must exist in two or more persons. Let's start by defining things before we get into the argument. First up, possible world. A possible world is basically a hypothetical situation. Calling it a possible world is not to say that such a world actually exists, it's just a description of what reality might be. A way for philosophers to see what ideas are coherent and what ideas are not. If something is possible, then we say it exists in some possible world. In metaphysics, the term possible has a different meaning than in epistemology. In epistemology, you could look at a difficult math problem and say, it's possible there's a solution for it, and it's possible there isn't. Which is like saying, for all I know, there is a solution to this problem. In metaphysics, something is possible only if it is logically coherent. For example, my wearing a red shirt is possible but the existence of square circles is not metaphysically possible. And in the realm of math problems, a problem either has a solution in all possible worlds or it doesn't. If something is possible, it exists in a possible world. Rolling a six on a die is one example. If something is necessary, it exists in all possible worlds. The laws of mathematics are examples of this. If something is contingent, it exists in some possible worlds, but not in others. If something is impossible, then it exists in no possible worlds. A square circle would be an example of this. Next up, entailment. To entail means to imply necessarily. For example, shape entails size. Necessarily, if something has a shape, it has a size. After that, great making properties. A great making property is a property that it is better to have than to lack. A lesser making property is a property that it is better to lack than to have. A neutral property is one that is neither. Maximal greatness is the state of having all great-making properties, and each to their maximal extent. It also means having no lesser-making properties. One of these properties is necessity. Nothing that exists contingently can be maximally great. This is not to say that something has to exist to be maximally great. Instead, if something maximally great exists, then its existence is either necessary or impossible. Now, one of Immanuel Kant's objections to an obsolete version of this argument is that existence is not a property. Well, this is true, and this argument does not assume that it is. It's immune to the classic criticism of Anselm's old ontological argument and should not be confused with it. Necessity is a property. Existence is not. Necessity does not entail existence. Necessity just means that if something exists, it exists in all possible worlds. Numbers have the property of necessity. Now on to the ontological argument itself. The argument has five premises, which, if true, entail the conclusion. Premise 1. It is possible that a maximally great being exists. Premise 2. If it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. Premise 3. If a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then a maximally great being exists in all possible worlds. Premise 4. If a maximally great being exists in all possible worlds, then a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Premise 5. If a maximally great being exists in the actual world, then a maximally great being exists. So the conclusion is, a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Premises 2 through 5 are pretty uncontroversial in academia. They are just restatements of the laws of modal logic accepted by theists and atheist philosophers alike. The controversy is in premise 1. 
Is it possible, in the metaphysical sense, that a maximally great being exists? I think that on the face of it, we have good reason to believe that this is true. As long as the concept of a maximally great being is coherent, then premise one is true. A school of philosophy called natural atheology has attempted to build arguments against the coherence of a maximally great being, but this project has been all but abandoned. Richard Swinburne explains why in his book called The Coherence of Theism. But I think we can advance in arguments in favor of premise one that will make it airtight. It was developed by Robert Madel and is called the modal perfection argument. Here's how this modal perfection argument works. 1. If a property is a great making property, its negation is a lesser making property. Makes sense. If it's better to have a property, it's worse to lack it. 2. Great making properties do not entail lesser making properties. I mean, how could a property be a great making property if it entailed all sorts of flaws? In premise 3, maximal greatness is a great making property. After all, having all other great making properties, is it not better to have the greatest, I believe, of all the great making properties? And the conclusion is, hence maximal greatness cannot entail its negation of non-maximal greatness. Now you may be scratching your head thinking, well of course, a property can't entail its negation or its opposite, right? Well, not entirely. It's perfectly within the laws of modal logic for a property, which is not a perfection anyway, to entail its negation. If the property is incoherent or it's impossible, a uh, square circularity is an example, we'll call this S, then it's necessary that everything have negation of square circularity, we'll call this non-square circularity, as a property. That's what it means for a property to be impossible. But if everything has non-square circularity, that means that every property entails non-square circularity. If it didn't, then something could have some other property and not have non-square circularity, which means it would have square circularity, which means square circularity would be a possible property, which it isn't. But if every property entails non-square circularity, then square circularity also entails non-square circularity. This is consistent with the principle of explosion, which states that if you assert a contradiction, you can logically infer anything from it. Hence, if it is impossible that a maximally great being exists, then necessarily nothing has maximal greatness. Hence, Hence, all things have non-maximal greatness. Hence, all properties entail non-maximal greatness, including maximal greatness. But we just established, from the three premises, that maximal greatness cannot entail non-maximal greatness. It is, after all, a perfection. For the minority of philosophers who deny the principle of explosion, and it is minority, here is another way to view the argument. If maximal greatness is an impossible property, then all properties entail non-maximal greatness. Hence, no property can be a great-making property. But this is absurd. It would mean that some properties such as goodness, intelligence, and wisdom are not better to have than to lack. So again, there's no way that maximal greatness can be some sort of impossible property. But if it is a possible property, then it exists in some being in some possible world, which means it's possible that a maximally great being exists, and therefore in such a being must exist in some possible world, and therefore in every world, and therefore in this world. And since some of these properties, such as omnipotence, omniscience, and moral perfection entail personality, it also follows that this maximally great being must be personal. But that's just the definition of a personal god, hence perfect being theology is correct. Let's go through a few common objections to this. The first is Dawkins' own delusional objection. In The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins attempts to use this argument to disprove the existence of God. He says that if God is the greatest possible being, then wouldn't it be greater for God to not exist and still bring the universe into being? But far from undermining the ontological argument, it shows the coherence of this argument. To answer Dawkins, would it be greater? Maybe. Is it possible for a being to not exist and bring the universe into existence? No, for in what possible world does a non-existent being exist? That's just incoherent. What about a maximally great pizza or a maximally great bird? The problem with positing anything physical is that physical things are dependent on space for their existence. They exist within space. And we know from modern cosmology that space once existed as a singularity, an infinitesimal point of infinite curvature. And no bird or pizza or anything physical could exist in such a state, being a bird or pizza or anything physical. So the idea of a necessary existing physical thing is undercut. But how do we know that only one maximally great being exists? Some of the properties possessed by a maximally great being cannot exist in more than one being in any possible world. That's why. Omnipotence is one example. If multiple beings are omnipotent, the logical contradiction follows if their wills come into conflict. If one omnipotent being chooses to bring about a state of affairs where a green elephant exists, let's say, and then such a state of affairs would be actualized. But if another omnipotent being in the same world wants to bring about a state of affairs where a green elephant doesn't exist, then that state of affairs won't be actualized. So in this world, a green elephant would both exist and not exist, but no possible world 
could contain such a contradictory state of affairs. So no possible world can have multiple omnipotent beings, hence there can only be one God. Finally, what about the unipersonal or unitarian God? A God that exists only as one person. Remember the difference from a previous video between monotheism, which is that there is one God, and unitarianism, that God is one person. I'm afraid such a unipersonal God would not be maximally great, for at least one of the properties of such a being love would be problematic. In order to be necessarily loving, God would have to be loving in all possible worlds. Since all that is not God is subject to the creative and destructive power of the Omnipotent One, God can be the only necessary existing being. This means that there are possible worlds where God alone exists. But is God loving in these worlds? It would make no sense to say that God is loving in a state of affairs where only He exists. Does He love Himself? Self-love doesn't sound like love to me. Love has to be expressed between one person and another in order to be true love. But that means that God God must exist in at least two persons, if not more. Hence, Unitarian monotheism is false. I want to remind all my viewers that these arguments are all logically valid, deductive arguments. You cannot avoid the conclusion of this argument without denying at least one of the premises. And in order to justify the denial of one of these premises, you have to show that the negation of the premise is more plausible than the premise itself. But I think to any fair-minded individual, all the premises presented are pretty obviously true. And with this sequence, we have a logical proof of the existence of a multipersonal God. The triune God of Scripture lives, and atheism is toast. Shalom Aleichem.